no problem. Good evening and welcome everyone. Welcome to our program this evening in which we will be celebrating profiles in courage. We laud individuals who have steadfastly dedicated their lives in defense of human rights and justice for all. The film we watched earlier today, as well as the one we just finished watching, they're both remarkable testimonials to the spirits of such individuals. My name is Jale Pir Nazar, and I welcome you on behalf of my department, the Department of Middle Eastern Languages and Cultures, formerly the Department of Near Eastern Studies Department, um, in which I served as a teacher for 30 some years before my retirement. In addition to my department, there are other departments that have co-sponsored this event for today. These are the Center for Middle Eastern Studies, Law School, UC Berkeley Initiative for Iranian Studies, and the recently established endowment in the memory of Mazyar Maksudnia for the specific study of Persian literature with a focus on poetry. Well, by way of introduction to our program this evening, as we discuss the movement for human rights in Iran, we focus on the figure of Nasrin Sotudeh, widely recognized as a distinguished lawyer and human rights activist in Iran today. Nasrin has become a symbol for the Iranian people's nonviolent struggle for justice, human dignity, and equality. As a defense lawyer, both inside and away from the courtrooms and in her writings, she has continuously defended the rights of women, ethnic and religious minorities. She has fought against child abuse and child labor, death penalty, specifically against teenagers. And she has advocated for animal rights and again, it is in, as a lawyer in defense of those rights for which she finds herself arrested and incarcerated. Women in Iran today face mounting social restrictions. As they are subjected to unjust laws and discriminatory practices. They bear the brunt of the violations of human rights that has become a daily, almost hourly, practice of the government in Iran. Many defenders of women's and human rights, journalists, filmmakers, students, teachers, authors, environmentalists, they're all generally imprisoned and sentenced to long prison terms, to lashes, to solitary confinements and other forms of torture. Yet many women today bear barriers they break the barriers. They fight for equality and justice. They join resistance movements. They get arrested. They are separated from their families and their loved ones as they commit to shaping a better future for Iran. Nasrin Sotudeh, Nargis Mohammadi, and many others are such fighters for human rights. On June 29th, 2021, the city council in Berkeley unanimously adopted a resolution in support of freedom for Nasrin Sotudeh and other prisoners of conscience in the Islamic Republic of Iran. Who are these prisoners of conscience, as Amnesty International calls them? What is the state of movement for civil rights in Iran today? How is that connected to the civil rights movements elsewhere? And how can we support these just struggles. This evening, we have a panel of well-informed, qualified professionals here with us to address and to discuss such questions in a roundtable format. The panel is moderated by Tarone Rusta, longtime human rights activist, women's rights advocate, and a community organizer for more than 35 years. She is the founder and the president of a nonprofit women's organization called the Voices 
of Women for Change, based here in California, also known as Bow for Change. Now, this organization is dedicated to empowering women and girls to overcome gender-based barriers and to live in a world free of violence and discrimination through consciousness raising and advocacy. Welcome, Tarane. Thank you so much, Alejana. I appreciate. Good evening, everyone. Um, tonight, I have the honor of introducing our distinguished uh, panelists and guests. So if you allow me, I would like to start by introducing the Nasreen film producers and directors. Um, I understand that they're supposed to show a clip of the film, uh, but somehow it didn't have any audio, but I believe some people um, got to see the film this morning. So, um, and after uh, introducing Jeff and Marsha, uh, I'll move on to our other panelists. Um, Jeff Kaufman, uh, he's a producer and director. He wrote documentaries like Every Act of Life, The State of Marriage, Father Joseph, The Savoy King, Chick Webb, and The Music That Changed America, Brush With Life, The Art of Being Edward Bieberman, An Education Under Fire, plus a number of short films for Amnesty International, programs for the Discovery Channel and the History Channel. He also edited and designed a book based on the film, Every Act of Life, contributed cartoons to the New Yorker and illustrations to the Los Angeles Times and the New York Times. He wrote and illustrated several children's books and hosted daily radio shows in Vermont and Los Angeles. Marsha Ross is also a producer and director. She produced documentaries like Every Act of Life, The State of Marriage, Father Joseph, and The Savoy King. Additionally, she has an over three decade career as an independent casting director and casting executive serving 16 years as EVP for casting at Walt Disney Motion Pictures and five years as VP for casting and talent development at Warner Brothers TV. Some of her film and television credits include Clueless, Cujo, 30 Something, Murder in Mississippi, 10 Things I Hate About You, the Princess Diaries, Romy and Michelle's High School Reunion, The Lookout, Enchanted, Oblivion, and Parental Guidance. She has received Career Achievement Awards from the Casting Society of America and the Hollywood Film Festival. Um, so you can see why <laughs> she does what she does because um, it takes quite a lot of talent uh, to produce so many films. Uh, our next uh, panelist is Dr. Laurel Fletcher. Uh, Professor Fletcher, she's a co-director of Berkeley School of Law's International Human Rights Law Clinic. She has co-authored a recent study of 10 countries in the Gulf region and neighboring states including Iran, documenting government repression of human rights defenders. So welcome Dr. Fletcher. And uh, our next guest is Dr. Nayre Tohidi. She is the former chair of gender and women's studies and the founding director of the Middle Eastern and Islamic studies at California State University Northridge. She's also a research associate in the program of Iranian studies at UCLA, coordinating the bilingual lecture series on Iran since 2003. Dr. Tohidi has integrated academic excellence with transnational human and women's rights activism. And as a longtime advocate, she represented women NGOs 
at the UN-sponsored third and fourth world conferences on women in Nairobi and Beijing. And finally, our last guest is uh, Mr. Amir Sultani. Amir Sultani is author of Zahra's Paradise, a graphic novel on human rights in Iran, which has been translated into six languages. He has worked closely with PEN America, as well as with Jeff Kaufman and Marsha Ross to publicize Nasreen's case and secure her freedom. As the producer and director of Dogtown Redemption, a documentary film about poverty and recycling, he has deep ties to the Bay Area. So welcome all of you to the round table tonight. Uh, the theme of tonight is Nasreen and the human rights struggles in Iran. And we cannot be talking about Nasreen Sutude without talking about what she represents. Nasreen has become an iconic figure in Iran and in the world. In fact, she's been known as the moral voice of Iran. She represents civil rights, human rights, women's rights, and nonviolent struggles. So um, I would like to start by asking uh, Jeff and Marsha, either one of you could go first, but if you could start your opening remarks. And as a reminder, all of our panelists, they each have five minutes in the beginning. Um, as we go through the panel, uh, there's gonna be more time for each one of them to share their views, but could you share your perspective and your views on Nasreen and everything that she represents? But also, could you represent? Uh, could you um, could you share your views on uh, wh why did you why did you become interested in Nasreen? Why her? What was it about her that interested you? Why did you make the film about her? And what was the content and the process? Because my understanding is that the film was made in Iran secretly. So um, who wants to go first? Marsha told me I should go first, so I'll do okay. what she says. <laughs> um, first of all, I have to say that it's, thank you so much for organizing this event and for everyone participating. It's very moving and it really speaks to what the film is about and what Nazarene is about, which is a universality of, of interest for human rights and, and mutual respect. That's something that Nazreen has dedicated her whole life to, as has her husband. Um, and that's what brings us together from different places. Uh, and I think if there's a way forward for the world, that's the way, coming together across barriers uh, and, and, and common uh, concern for each other. And at a time when we see uh, Ukraine uh, being assaulted by the Russians, I think there's another connection as well. Um, Nazreen and all these women and, and all of the activists in Iran are so inspiring because they show individuals who love their country, uh, but know that that love of country means moving it to a better, more humane place um, and facing huge obstacles to do that, the onslaught of the state. And, and here you see the same thing uh, in Ukraine, people coming together in that country and the support from outside the world in the face of, of of, of this uh, violence uh, because um, they love democracy and they want to control their own future. Uh, and that's really what, what the activists in Iran have been trying to do. Uh, they have the right to, to um, have opportunity and control their own future. Uh, we reached out to Nazreen. Initially, I did a number of other projects about Iran and deeper and deeper and deeper, I had uh, a, a great respect for the Iranian people and the Iranian culture. Uh, we were also mutually distressed by uh, the uh, is, is, is anti-Islamic fervor that was being ginned up in the United States for political purposes. And Nazreen just seemed to speak about everything that was right and everything that we wanted to feel good about uh, by her character and by her actions. And so through mutual friends, we've reached out to her. And, and I have to say that our initial idea was through Nazreen to tell a group story and also to have a deep dive into Iranian culture and Iranian life. And that was her interest as well. I think the first thing she said was, well, I don't want this just to be about me. How can we make it about others as well? 
Um, and why don't you take so, it from there? Well, and so in order to make the film, was, yes, it was very complicated. We couldn't really go to Iran for a lot of reasons. I mean, we would have been arrested pretty quickly if we'd been there and also having, let alone, not just as Americans, but having a film crew. But then we were very fortunate because some very brave people agreed to follow her with their cameras. And because they were embedded with her, we were able to capture a lot of material about her life and some intimacy in her work and with her family and out in public that we wouldn't have been able to get any other way. And at that point, the um, and then we had to have it sort of secretly shipped out of the country. And it, you know, it was an interesting way to make a film, both in terms of receiving footage at different times, not always consecutive, you know, and, and crafting a story of what we were, you know, what we were receiving, what Jeff was looking for and asking, and also was uh, obviously, you know, in Farsi. Uh, language, you know, we don't speak. I mean, I've learned a few words, but basically we don't speak it and we work with translators. And that, you know, that was another really interesting experience as filmmakers making a film in a foreign language and making sure that you capture the spirit of what the people are saying. You know, it's not just word for word, but it's, you know, it's also the intention of what she was saying. And I think I just want to finish for our side to say that getting to know Nazarene through this process has been life changing. She's an extraordinary human being who has come to represent, you know, she's become a dear friend of ours, she and Reza, but also has come to represent so much to me, you know, as a woman who, you know, has dedicated her life with great perseverance and great purpose, you know, to making a, a difference in the lives of, of her children, of other people's children, of, of you know, her fellow citizens. It's, it's, it's been extraordinarily, you know, inspiring and motivating for me. Thank you so much for sharing your perspectives. And if you allow me, I'm going to move on to Dr. Fletcher. You technically are Nasreen's colleague. You're both lawyers. So, um, so if you could please kindly share your perspectives on the work that you've done um, and your perspective on Nasreen and the human rights issues in Iran, because I know you've done some studies on that. Sure. Um, I just tried to share my screen. Can people see it? Yes. Okay, great. Um, well, thank you. And I wanted to thank the Berkeley Law students who I know have worked so hard um, to organize the event as well as the other sponsors. Um, and it's really an honor for me to participate along with the filmmakers. I love to be able to see the and talk to the creative generators of this powerful, powerful film, and activists and scholars who have far greater no direct knowledge of the struggle for human rights in Iran than I do. Um, so as, I, as was said, I, I co-direct Berkeley Law's International Human Rights Law Clinic. We've been around for 20 years working to support the and protect frontline human rights, human rights defenders. So my contribution to tonight's discussion is quite modest. I want to put Nasreen's case in the context of human rights trends in Iran and in the region. Uh, but first, I really want to note how fitting it is that we are discussing this film on International Women's um, Day. Na uh, Nasreen's fierce struggle for human rights, including women's rights, vividly illustrates the risks that um, women human rights defenders take in Iran. So last November, the clinic released a 10-country study uh, jointly with the Gulf Center for Human Rights called Who Will Be Left to Defend Human Rights. Um, the report um, documents 20, 225 incidents between May 2018 and October 2020, evidencing how governments in the region are using anti-cyber crime and other laws, along with specialized law enforcement institution to criminalize online expression in violation of international law. Um, the attacks on human rights defenders in this part of the world is not new. But what is new is that as so many aspects of our lives involve online communication, governments in the region and around the world have adapted their tools of repression to this online environment. So what kind of expression is targeted? We see in Iran and across the region, it's political dissent or expression of ideas like women's equality and autonomy, um, ideas that challenge government policies or beliefs that is not tolerated. And the targeting of lawyers like Nasreen and journalists and other activists is a dangerous trend because without these leaders 
to disseminate accurate information and to fight for human rights violations. Um, without that measure of protection, then human rights, excuse me, human rights themselves wither. And of course, this is exactly the intent of illegal governments in the in theocracies like Iran. In our study, we found credible reports of numerous violations that were associated with government targeting of online expression. In Iran, what we saw in, in the period that we studied was a pattern of arbitrary detentions, incommunicado detention, meaning without access to family or lawyers, enforced disappearances, torture, and fair trial rights. So I wanted to give um, some context to Nazreen's case. Now, the government has a longstanding pattern of persecution of women in Iran, um, including those who have peacefully advocated for their rights. Reporters Without Borders has found that Iran is now the world's biggest jailer of female journalists. In April 2019, the government arrested three women after they appeared in a video protesting the compulsory veiling laws in conjunction with International Women's Day. We saw one of those cases in the film. The Iranian government charged and found the three women guilty under articles of the Islamic Penal Code. And in July, judges of Branch 28 of Tehran's Revolutionary Court sentenced three women human rights defenders to prison for their peaceful activities. Two received sentences of 16 years, while the third has been sentenced to 23 and a half years. Now, in this same period is Nazreen Satuta's um, case, when she was sentenced to 148 lashes and 38 years in prison including for her defense of the women arrested for protesting compulsory veiling. So, you know, you can see here that the government is going after leaders of social movements and leaders of human rights movements. And this crackdown continues. The Special Security Prosecution Unit, known as FATA, announced in May 2020 that women, including public figures, are in breach of provisions of the Islamic Penal Code when they appear without the hijab on social media, right? So the government is criminalizing just the expression of literal images of women that do not comport with, um, uh, with their views and policies. And international, this is in violation of international law, which requires that morality laws restricting expression must strictly must be strictly and, and narrowly tailored, and Iran's um, laws do not meet that standard. Um, I wanted to mention briefly one other case of a journalist, Rohal Azam, who was living in Paris as a refugee after fleeing Iran in 2011. In October of 2019, Iranian authorities, now I'll say it slowly, Iranian authorities abducted Zam from Iraq, where he had traveled, from Paris to Iraq, um, Iraqi intelligence officials cooperated with Iranian authorities uh, to effectuate that arrest and abduction hours after he arrived in Iraq. Reportedly, uh, authorities arrested Zam for operating a news channel on Telegram, Right, an online news source, which reportedly leaked information exposing government corruption and had posted videos of demonstrations during the 2017 and 18 protests. Amnesty International reports that court documents alleged that Zam was a spy for Israel and France and cooperated with the, with the United States. And in June of 2020, Branch 15 of the Revolutionary Court in Tehran sentenced Zam to death under the Islamic Penal Code for, quote, spreading corruption on earth through his news channel. Now, the United Nations has repeatedly held that suppression and prosecution of opinions critical of government policies violate the right of freedom of expression. Four days after losing his appeal in December of 2020, authorities carried out the execution. Now, international law reserves the death penalty for the most serious crimes involving intentional killing. The government's abduction, sentencing, and execution of Zam are clear violation of, of Iran's human rights obligations. And this 
example also demonstrates um, that Iran, along with other countries in the region, Saudi Arabia, UAE, and Kuwait, are cooperating with each other to affect these types of abductions and exercising um, reaching beyond their territorial jurisdiction to target human rights defenders. So the opportunity here is to uplist the voices and the story of Nasreen and other human rights defenders in Iran because their bravery and courage are living examples of the alternative to repression. It's the fight to defend human rights and gathering here today is part of that struggle. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Fletcher, for sharing your studies and the work you've done um, on the issues of violations of human rights in Iran. Uh, I'm hoping that tonight we have some uh, students listening and watching uh, because th there's so much in this presentation tonight that I'm hoping that uh, a lot of young people will get to listen, hear, and learn and do something about it. Um, I would like to move on to Amir Sultani. Amir Jan, uh, could you please uh, start with your opening remarks and share your views? Uh, thank you very much, um, Ms. Rustav. It's a real honor to be speaking to students at the University of Berkeley uh, in the company of uh, my friends, Jeff and Marsha, whose, whose film has really been a lifeline, I think, not only for Nasreen, but for uh, many of us activists. Um, it allowed us to um, coalesce around an idea and it allowed us to uh, connect across uh, countries and all the places that the film has traveled, including uh, the university today. Um, I thought um, I, I had one idea uh, to start with, but then I came across a Nasreen statement, um, which she had issued on um, uh, March, 20, March 6, 2020. Um, on a, case, a plea for peace on International Women's Day. And I thought I'd just read, read what she has had to say and um, defer some of my comments to a little bit later. Um, this is a piece in Time Magazine, which I think Jeff helped facilitate. So I wanted to, uh, as always, thank him and Marsha for what they've done, but listen to her, listen to her, her voice. One afternoon on a late spring day in 2018, a group of officers from the Iranian prosecutor's office and the Ministry of Intelligence came and arrested me while I was home alone. They took me to Evin prison, that's our nightmare of a prison in Iran, in a green taxi. Let's get in, feel the texture of this. In absentia, I had been sentenced to five years in prison for my work as a women's rights and human rights attorney. A few months later, seven more charges were added and I was given a total of over 33 years in prison, plus 148 lashes. How do they come up with that number, or even that many years? The heaviest of these sentences was, for, was 12 years for promoting immorality and indecency. What happens when girls in Iran hear this? Currently, I am in the, this is in 2020. Currently, I am in the women's ward, which consists of three rooms and 40 inmates three rooms, 40 inmates. Most have been arrested for political reasons. The occupants of Evin's prison's women's ward are human rights activists, women's rights activists, civil and environmental activists, religious minorities and mystics, members of the labor movement and individuals with dual citizenship who are accused of spying. And one of the things that Jeff, Marsh and I have always felt with Nastreen is that there is not a moment where she talks about herself. It's always about the people who are around her and next to her in prison. I spend my days exercising, making crafts, reading, and having group discussions, besides attending to my own personal chores. Sundays are visitation days. And if I'm not forbidden from visits, I can see my family. And then imagine Reza and the kids constantly, Reza, her husband, and the kids constantly on going back and forth to prison. In prison, I sometimes offer limited classes about human rights issues. So prison's always a classroom, right? To those who are interested, but mainly I preoccupy myself with learning and teaching others about truth and reconciliation commission commissions in other countries. This internationalism is always there and present with what Nasreen does. She's constantly learning about what's going on around her. 
None of the girls of Engelob Street, the women who protested Iran's compulsory hijab law by publicly removing their headscarves and waving them on a stick are here. But a few of my cellmates are young women who on International Women's Day last year went into the subway in Tehran, spoke to passengers and handed out flowers. And another move, this group had supported me by holding up my pictures in the subway. Subway as a place for dissent, right? Because of this, they received heavy sentences, which deepens my sense of responsibility. This sense of responsibility is just echoed for, for all of us um, who've been pushing for her freedom. Now she gets into the heart of things. Iran is a country where violations of women's rights are systemic. This makes it even more important to honor and commemorate International Women's Day. And what an honor to be here in the presence of um, Dr. Rustan, Dr. Tohedim, Ms. Fletcher and Marsha, and Jeff, of course, um, and Zingi, thank you. And Dr. Niazi, wherever she is, because she made this possible, right? And Eleanor Roosevelt, who's sort of hanging in the background here. On this day, I'm thinking about the years that have passed, the years of our silence and cap captivity, years of protest, bondage, and the walls behind which we are trapped. Not just veils and walls, veils and walls. However, I'm, I, however, I also am thinking about this year, a year of tragedy and illness for the Iranian people. And if you recall, Nasreen um, went on a hunger strike to protest the exposure of prisoners to COVID. It's the consequence of hostility and enmity coming around to us, right? Then this is where you know, her, her grace comes through consequence of hostility and enmity coming back around to us. I keep looking back and reviewing the path we've taken. Where did we go wrong? Why didn't we succeed? Why couldn't our government govern properly? Why didn't we know how to resist effectively and peacefully? On this International Women's Day, as a de deadly virus sickens my country, I throw my hands down and as a citizen in a gentle voice, always a gentle voice. I ask the government to end their animosity with the world, to look at the world through the eyes of peace and to trust life and human beings. I ask human rights activists to help us in our peaceful endeavor. I specifically extend my hand to American citizens. Our governments have been rivals for years with little regards for us. On this day of March 8th, I also ask every Iranian around the world to help us in our pursuit of peace, this fundamental aspect of survival. Happy International Women's Day, Nasser Institute. Thank you so much for, um, for sharing Nasrin's heart and soul with the audience, because what you read from Nasrin's statement last year really was, a, it opened a little window to her heart and how she thinks and how she feels. So thank you so much for that. Thank uh, I'm gonna to turn to Dr. Tohidi. Uh, I know that you've been very much involved uh, with this work to free Nasreen. And um, if you could please talk about not only Nasreen and her relevance to what is going on in Iran and women's rights issues and human rights issues, but in the global context, her role, her influence, what, what does that mean for the rest of the world? Uh, if you could speak to that, please. Sure, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> let me also quickly thank uh, all and each of you for um, <clears throat> the labor of love you have put in organizing this uh, program. I know how much uh, passion and belief and devotion it takes to do things like this. Um, <clears throat> I'm worried that I have uh, a lot of uh, remarks to make, but I'm, I don't know how much I can achieve in this uh, short time. But uh, I want also like Amir start with uh, Nasreen herself. Uh, as you said, uh, Tarana John, that <clears throat> Nasrin is the moral voice of Iran 
I want to say that she's becoming one of the moral voices internationally, not only about Iran. Uh, she just recently issued a statement, uh, an open letter to Secretary General of United Nations on March 1st in 2020. She says, in the past few days, the world has witnessed the Russian Federation's military aggression against Ukraine, a sovereign state that acquired its full independence under international law almost 30 years ago in 1991. Ukraine has mounted a laudable resistance in the face of this aggression, far from getting crushed in silence under the boot of aggressors their resistance is a call on the world to rush to their defense. As a woman who has lived in a country that endured eight years of war, I can imagine the fear and trauma unleashed from this naked act of aggression and war against defenseless civilians and wish to express my horror at such a shameless violation. This is a war between democracy and dictatorship. But fortunately, the people of Ukraine are not standing alone in this struggle. And the world is rushing to Ukraine's defense with great concern. In this war, Russian anti-war protesters who are also paying the price of hostilities are being attacked and imprisoned. So she goes on uh, giving some examples of uh, those people. And then she says that uh, in the name of humanity at the onset of Putin's assault and con uh, consider them as the most laudable of your uh, declarations in about uh, the secretary general, she says. Uh, sadly, the aggressors has not um, hidden your call on this issue. He didn't count on the nobility, freedom loving and independent spirit of the people of Ukraine and the world. Like millions of other people around the world, I too am shocked by this vulgar attack, act of aggression. I stand in solidarity and support of the people of Ukraine and declare that world peace without opposition to Russia's aggression and support for the people of Ukraine is meaningless. As such, I ask your excellency to use all the international instruments and resources at your disposal to bring an end to this naked act of aggression in the hope of an end to all wars Nasrin so today. Now, uh, the reason I started with Nasrin's uh, statement because she again became like the voice of many Iranians at a very critical moment. And it was dangerous to her because the Iranian government sides uh, with Putin. Uh, so this is gonna add to Nasrin's crimes, so to speak. And, uh, but still she had the courage and principled moral standards to speak out and speak up. Honestly, as someone who, has, who was a Fulbright professor in former Soviet Union and has done extensive research as a consultant for the UN in that region, in Central Asia, in um, the Caucasus, I feel kind of affinity to people in Russia, people in Central Asia, although I have never been to Ukraine, but I have been always in, uh, admirer of pro-democracy and pro-human rights activists in all those republics. So that's why I honestly, personally, I have been overwhelmed with the war that is going on now. And my heart goes out to uh, both Russians who have been courageously opposing this war and Ukrainians who have been courageously defending themselves and their country. Uh, but Nasrin's uh, statement indicates the connectedness of Iran's local, national, regional geopolitics to the global context and displays the transnational nature and interconnectedness of the human rights struggle for all of us in whichever country we reside. So let me quickly refer to 
some of uh, these regional developments that have affected the current context of struggles for human rights. The recent return of the Taliban to power can embolden the forces of darkness and enemies of human rights and democracy in Iran and other countries in the region like Pakistan, Central Asia, and even Russia. Um, so I'm going to skip some part of this and then go to uh, other development, which is the, uh, in addition to the Taliban, is the Putin's war in Ukraine that can also inevitably contribute to the surge of violence, further militarization, growing despotism, poverty, extreme and ethnocentric or racialized populist nationalisms, and a stronger glorification of hegemonic and toxic masculinity in the region and even globally. So I cannot avoid seeing how our struggle for human rights, especially women's rights, in this critical and dangerous moment are going to become overshadowed by the war in Ukraine. Through a couple of citations from statements made by advocates of human and women rights, social justice and peace, I tried to show the commonality and interconnectedness of uh, our transnational struggle for freedom and human rights. In this case, specifically among peoples of Iran, Russia, Ukraine, and USA. The Islamist regime in Iran, specifically its absolute ruler, uh, Ayatollah Khamenei, and its military arm, the uh, Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps, is a close ally of Vladimir Putin. It may seem ironic and surprising given the one being an Islamist and very religious, and the other, that is Putin, a former communist and KGB man, hence secular or perhaps totally godless. But we have seen that the exigency of economic interests and political power overrules such ideological backgrounds. To save their powers as neighbors, both need each other. Both Khamenei and Putin represent dictatorship, autocracy, the rule of oligarchy and corrupt billionaires. Both view liberal democracy as their main foe and both detest human, especially women's rights, especially feminists and sexual minorities. Some American and Russian feminist scholars uh, and researchers, uh, for, for instance, uh, Professor Stephen Fish at this very university, at the University of uh, Berkeley, who is a comparative political scientist uh, and has studied democracy and regime change in developing and post-communist countries, and has written a, a book that ha called Democracy Derailed in Russia, The Failure of Open Politics. He, ha he has shown, and some others too, that Putin's view uh, views and policies overlap with right-wing populists and the Orthodox Church, especially concerning the idea of Russian superiority over other ethnic groups, homophobia and confrontation and violence against sexual minorities, against feminists and the like. Putin supported a law against uh, sexual minorities in 2013 and in 2017 supported a piece of legislation that legitimized certain types of domestic violence. According to the official statistics of Russian police, about 40 women get killed per day because of domestic violence by their male partners. Ironically, we see some worrisome commonalities between Iran and Russian dictators with the former president of the US Donald Trump, whose self-serving autocratic hunger for staying in power and enriching his own oligarchy brought the US close to a coup and civil war. It is not surprising that Trump and Khamenei are now on the side of Putin. They both have more respect and trust toward Putin than any statement, statement or state women in the West. 
Another unfortunate irony and contradiction complicating the struggle for human rights in Iran and other countries in that uh, is that uh, among the left that is expected to be on the side of women's rights, human rights, are some leftists who are not trying to justify Putin and refuse to condemn his aggression and invasion of Ukraine. Those are the type of communists in Russia, USA, Iran, and other countries who usually do not care for democracy and human rights, except when human rights are violated by the United States. They consider the US and European liberal democracy as the ultimate evil, hence blame the US for every war and almost every international conflict as they see the US as the only almighty imperialist force and they dismiss the role and responsibility of other hegemonic and imperialistic states like Russia. So uh, let me also cite um, a few words from uh, the National Women's Studies Association in the US that interestingly was issued on the same day that Nasreen issued her statement. They say, we take seriously our charge to never be silent in the face of evil. We understand that we do not have the luxury to sit by while countries are attacked, war is being waged, and women and children are being killed. As Audrey Lord taught us, we know that our silence will not protect us. And as Angela Davis reminds us, if they come for freedom seekers around the world in the morning, they will come for us in the night. Freedom and struggle are international issues and solidarity is a feminist issue for us. As feminists, activists, teachers, students and scholars, we will never be silent in the face of violence, terror, destruction and oppression, which means that we will always speak up against injustice and for freedom, no matter the cost. Um, and then I, I think my time is over, right? Or can I go on? With your anyone? time is over, yes. Unfortunately, we would love to <laughs> hear the rest of your talk, but um, I was told to end um, the panel at 7.30. We already 7.30 and I haven't asked any questions yet. So. Okay. <laughs> but maybe you can, um, you can address um, the rest of us uh, during the Q and A uh, or the, the question I'm I'm about to ask, and this question is really for every single panelist. And the reason is that I, I I'm sure that you each bring your own unique perspective based on your own background and experience and all that. Last year, in a secret ballot, forty-three out of fifty-four nations, uh, UN nations, um, in the UN Economic and Social Council elected Iran to the Commission on the Status of Women. This commission, as I'm sure you know, is the UN's main body um, dedicated to promoting, promoting gender equality and women's empowerment. Electing a government that has institutionalized gender-based discrimination and is responsible for so much violence against the Iranian women was really a slap in the face of millions of Iranian women uh, who have been violated by the Islamic Republic for the past 43 years. So my question is, what is the role and the responsibility of the international community and human rights community to expel Iran from the Commission on the Status of Women and to undo this insult. Uh, if I may, I'd like to start with Dr. Fletcher, if you could uh, uh, talk to this and then we'll move on to other panelists. Uh, Dr. Fletcher, your thoughts. Well, I think that um, that example you know, points to uh, you know, one of the many flaws in the international system is that states control um, 
states control the uh, the election of representatives who serve as state representatives on on certain kinds of of UN bodies. There are other bodies that have independent experts, and a feature of um, of the Commission on the Status of Women and the Human Rights Council is that states are elected in their um, uh, representational capacity, and that sets up exactly the kind of um, you know appalling outcome where you can have a blatant human rights violator like Iran elected to a body that is charged with who has, that has a mandate to uh, to promote women's rights. I mean, it's it just points to the absurdity of uh, the weakness of the system, um, and the question is what can be done about it. And I think that that there is where mobilization and solidarity and uplifting um, the voices and the issues to heighten the contradictions can have um, some effect on the those kinds of outcomes because states are casting their votes and it's in it, it, and it's opaque as you said in the secret ballot about what kind of um, inducements um, have been given what promises have been made that we're not privy to that lead to those results and I should say that you know Iran's election is not the first nor will it be the last time that you've had an egregious human rights violator sit on a human rights body um, and I think that um, so part of it is exposure and the other part is to um, to to invest in other aspects of the human international human rights mechanisms that can be counters where there are independent experts where there are um, um, independent mechanisms that can work more effectively to draw attention to human rights abuses and violations in, in Iran and other violating countries. Thank you for the question. Thank you for sharing. Um, I would like to uh, ask the same question from Jeff and Marsha. Uh, I'd like to add something to that, and I appreciate everything that uh, Professor Fletcher said. Um, one thing is that one of the things I've been struck by with Nazreen is I often feel that she's playing chess on a level that the Iranian authorities can't play. She's thinking five moves ahead, or in a different metaphor, uh, in martial arts, you know, she uses their moves against them. And 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 possibly uh, with Iran being on this, you know, it's ludicrous that they would be on uh, a women's rights council. But maybe that's a way of showing the utter hypocrisy of the regime and the fact that they're on this council. They don't represent those issues. May bring it even more to the fore. Um, there are so many U United Nations uh, um, agreements, international agreements that Iran has signed that they don't live up to. And I think it's a, it's it's a way of of calling attention to that. <clears throat> I should note that. The Iranian uh, deputy ambassador the, the, to the United Nations today made a speech praising uh, Iran's stand on women's rights. And it said that uh, one of Iran's priorities is the advancement and self actualization of women. So that's the message they want to get out. How ludicrous is that? And so rather than accept it, use it against them and show their utter depravity. And, and one little other thing, uh, they're also uh, a signatory towards anti-hostage taking uh, agreements in the United Nations and internationally. And I think I'd like to just use this, uh, this, this, this moment to also say that one of the really uh, egregious things that, that uh, Russia is doing now that Iran has done over the years is hold international travelers hostage. It's disgusting. It's immoral. Um, there's a wonderful piece in the Washington Post right now about Ahmad Shargi that I urge you to go see. Um, and um, I think all that fits together. <coughs> I just want to, Dr. Fletcher, I want to say that what you're talking about is solidarity and standing outside this. I mean, the United Nations, as far as I'm concerned, is an incredibly hypocritical body that uh, allows for many things and doesn't really live up to a lot of things. It makes pronouncements. It doesn't do anything. You know, it's extremely political and everybody's trying to, you know, protect their relationship with everybody else. I feel like it's a very political organization. And I don't feel personally for me, I don't see it as a reliable actor and someone. I'm sorry, for me, I have a real problem with, with it. All right. Well, maybe I we're married and we love each other, but I disagree. <laughs> I, I just have a problem with the hypocrisy. And I think it is really important, you know, for other organizations and other people that care about this stuff, you know, to, 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 to women's rights, human rights, 
you know, to come together as, as people that are really active in this area and to take part in actions, you know, that are very, that do really stand behind, you know, what they believe in. That's what I feel. We've had a great ally with Nazreen with the United Nations. I, I saw Dr. For human rights. No, I mean, it's individuals are, you know, look, always in all organizations, and I've been a lot, parts of lots of organizations, always there are individuals that are really wonderful. It's just, you know, when you have a larger body that, you know, one person alone who is very well-intentioned can't move and always can't move an entire body, even if they're very supportive of what, you know, you're trying to accomplish. Well, thank you so much for uh, different perspectives on this. Um, and I think that's what's needed to, to come up with the best way to address this issue because it's really uh, impacting the credibility of the United Nations in the eyes of the world to have a country like Iran uh, on commission on status of women. Uh, Dr. Tohidi, I know you're raising your hand and so is Mr. Sultani, but you, were, uh, you raised your hand before, so go ahead, please. Okay, just, just briefly, um, following Dr. Fletcher's uh, points, that we should remember that United Nations is United States. Uh, they are representing the states that are, are in power. So not necessarily people's voices directly, especially for the dictatorial states, that they, they don't get, uh, people don't get represented. So that's where I think what we should do, we, since we cannot go uh, and change the hierarchy and the mechanisms of the way UN works over the night, uh, we can strengthen the transnational NGOs that are pushing the UN, or in other words, have a watchdog uh, for, for the UN. And people have done that. There are forces that have become like watchdog. And uh, that, that is, I mean, in part our responsibility because those uh, positions are rotating in the UN and people are voting. So it is the shame about the, the states who vote for say Saudi Arabia or Iran to become the, the chair. Uh, but but it, that's, that is based on rotation. The other thing is that I want here to be fair with respect to human rights and especially women's rights, the UN has done a lot of good things. Some people have even, since I have worked with the UN, I, I'm aware of both the shortcomings and also some, uh, some co important contributions that the UN has, uh, has uh, done uh, during the uh, four international global conferences. And the, and the Commission on the Status of Women has been really wonderful. They have done a lot to promote women's rights and uh, they have worked with NGOs, with women's movements. And uh, so we cannot dismiss the UN. It, it has a lot of problems, but that is the only uh, resource we have, only, uh, resort, uh, you know, to only uh, entity that at least we can use its literature to legitimize uh, legally and politically our demands. So it's complicated, but I, I get that frustration that uh, you mentioned, uh, uh, but Okay, thank you so much. And uh... I would like to move on to Mr. Soltani. And with that, at the end of your talk, uh, we will have to start the Q&A question and go to the floor uh, or to the Zoom for the questions that the audience have. So uh, Mr. Soltani, go ahead. Uh, just, uh, just very quickly, um, I kind of think that we are in uh, sort of the kind of struggles that we're in are aren't the struggles of a day or a week. These are, these are marathons that have been taking place over really the centuries. Um, and if we expect too much or too quickly from international institutions or organizations, that may not, that may not always come through, but I think the tide really does matter. I mean, uh, Nasreen, when she was in um, Evin prison or even the letter that Ms. Tohidi just um, 
uh, read, she's direct, she's uh, directing herself to the, um, you know, to the Secretary General of the UN. And, you know, working with Penn, we were constantly uh, writing to the to the UN on occasion, you know, Beijing Women's Conference and so forth, with Nasreen in prison, the celebration of the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and there's the woman who's sort of the incarnation of that declaration, again in prison. So I think that the, the, the tensions really matter, and the ways in which we use, for us as uh, human rights activists, our challenge is to create those tensions um, and to work with them and work through them, uh, kind of like water. So just very, very quickly. And then just a little minor point. When Nasreen went on her hunger strike, the person who went to visit her afterwards in prison was a gentleman named Bore Kani, who's the human rights guy at uh, the Judiciary's International Human Rights representative. And we had been banging on our drums, Jeff, Marsha, Nair, and myself, through, throughout whatever yourself, Ms. Rusta. And that echo chamber definitely had an impact in Iran because they had to do a PR move. And the PR move was to publish, you know, Bore Kani, again, talking about the actualization of women, how the last place we want women to be is in prison and so on, and the family in Islamic world and all of these things. So we get these, we get these statements, and there's in, and then and then of course he ends up being the Iran's nuclear negotiator. So the 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 energy is there, the tensions are there, and the possibilities are there. And somebody like Nasreen, for me, with her hunger strike, with she's creating these opportunities for us. And, and so it becomes incumbent on us and on the UC Berkeley law students and community, which has always been, universities have always been the hub for change, right? To, to really push these points home. Like when somebody's passing you a ball from Evin prison in Iran and you don't take a shot, you don't even realize that the ball is in front of you, shame on us. Um, so, so anyway. Uh, I, I don't look to the UN for guidance. Um, I look to Nasreen or to Mandela or to Havel, these people for guidance. And then when they come to power, yes, they can come to the UN and make their speeches and so on. But we can't wait for, we can't wait for the, you know, the states are like elephants. I mean, we tried to move them and it was so hard to just get Justin Trudeau to say what was obvious, like free Nasreen from prison. So we just can't, we just can't, attach our hopes to the big guys. Can I, can I add something to what he just said? I must, I must, because it's so important what you said. Nazreen's going on that hunger strike, which every day we were worried she was gonna die. It was terrible. She did that to bring attention to the situation in the prison so, so that you know other people wouldn't die from COVID, okay? She accomplished more. I mean, it's very, it was very frightening to all of us, but she accomplished more doing that. And, she, and he's right. I mean, she brought the world's attention to the treatment of people in the prisons by her incredibly selfless and yet dangerous, you know, action. So true. And um, we have a question from one of the audience. The question is addressed to Jeff and Marsha. What is the um, update on the status of Nasreen? Well, I, I, yeah, yes. I should say that we've been in touch with Nasreen and Reza, her husband, um, quite frequently, but always with Amir uh, translating. So we're all part of the same circle. Um, as you may know, you know, at the end of our film, uh, Nasreen was in the Vian prison. Uh, but she'd gone on a hunger strike. She'd been protesting for, as Marcia said, uh, for better health conditions in, in Avin. Um, and as punishment, <coughs> excuse me, the Iranian authorities um, sent her to, um, to um, Garchak prison, which is notoriously the most unhealthy prison uh, in Iran. She had already been suffering from a heart condition. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. And, um, and soon after getting to Garchak, she got COVID. 
Um, she was released on a brief medical leave because of her heart condition. And when she got home, she gave her whole family COVID as well. So um, since then, she's had several times back in uh, Garchak. One time she was home on medical leave and she'd been told by the authorities, oh, you're gonna stay home for a couple more weeks. And then the next day they said, nope, you're going back right now and we're freezing your bank accounts. So there's this been a psychological push and pull trying to tear down her morale. But for the last several months, she has been home on medical leave. She had uh, an angioplasty for her heart. Um, she still has some health conditions. Uh, but she has not been silent at home, uh, and um, and she her sort of resilient, amazing, um, concerned spirit always bubbles up every time we talk to her. I, I, I want to say, for first of all, if you've seen the movie, thank you so much. You know, if you haven't seen the movie, it's on Hulu, it's on Amazon, it's on iTunes. We have a website, Nazarene Film. You can find out where to watch it there. Uh, you know, I can't really stress enough, and this comes directly from Nazreen, we take no real credit for this, but, you know, Nazreen has really expressed to us, you know, the impact that the film has made for her, you know, both personally in prison, in which she knows that she's not forgotten, which has helped her keep going. It really makes a difference. I mean, we've heard this time and again, when people are in, in, in prison, you know, they feel really forgotten. And so all the actions on her behalf you know, have kept her going. But it's also really made a difference in terms of, you know, a certain kind of a blanket of protection. This has been very difficult, you know, for the government to sort of specifically, you know, target her because everyone knows who she is. It makes it so much harder. Um, so, you know, I, you know what, so what we've learned from this and we have done a global impact campaign and we've tried, you know, repeatedly like tonight to just keep the word out about her is you know talking about this stuff taking actions doing things you know being vocal um you know making sure that people are not forgotten is an is makes a huge difference for political prisoners i mean we were just talking about a situation today uh, where you know often people are afraid to be, go public when their family is arrested and they're or somebody's arrested but what really makes a difference is noise make a lot of noise about people because you know in the end you don't know what's going to happen, and it can go either way. But it but it can also help in a very positive way. Yeah, just briefly, there's this wonderful group, a grassroots group called Friends of Nazarene, and it represents many other groups like it of people getting together to make their voices join together um, to to reach out for Nazarene and others. And I, I love those people, and I love everyone else like that around the world. Um, and um, every political prisoner deserves someone like that in their corner. Indeed, they do. Um, we have to move on to the live audience to take some of their questions. So uh, we have the first question from the live audience, please. Can you hear me? Yes. OK, awesome. Uh, thank you so much for the vibrant discussion. Uh, Live audience, please, if you have any question, come up to the podium and ask the question. If you wanna, uh, don't want your face to show, I will turn off the video for us. Um, thank you so much. Dr. Miyazaki, do you have um, We have our first question from the audience. Thanks so much again for everyone. Um, this panel is amazing. I am looking at questions when, uh, from, uh, from the um, audience before. And one question that came up was, uh, what can legal, legally countries do outside of Iran to uh, impact anything? You guys have talked about NGOs um, putting pressure on the United Nations, but is there any legal international law that can um, impact countries like that? And I'm just repeating someone's question. I, and this can be to anyone. Actually, actually, uh, Professor Fletcher, since you are the expert on international law, um, I think it's a complicated question. It's a really great question. Um, it depends on what you mean by law, and it depends on what you mean by legal action, um, and it depends on what kind of violation. Um, so that's probably not a very satisfying answer, but in, in brief, in order to bring um, a legal action, you need to have a, a violation, you need to have uh, 
decision-making body that has jurisdiction um, and you need to have evidence to present that case. Um, in terms of international opportunities to do that for um, Iran, there is no regional human rights mechanism um, that exists that covers um, that covers Iran. So the opportunities for international litigation are are very limited. Um, there's human rights um, independent experts at the United Nations um, where you can file petitions. And Nasreen's case has been the subject of what's called special procedures. Um, those are sort of emergency measures and communications that the United Nations um, independent experts can make to Iran. They've made several, so that's a way those get published. Um, it's a, for a US audience, that doesn't sound like a lot, um, but in the space of what can put pressure on the Iranian government and authorities, um, no government likes to be um, called out uh, as an international human rights violator. And that's the leverage that um, most of the mechanisms that are international mechanisms are available. In terms of um, courts, like um, in the United States, um, again, it's uh, getting jurisdiction over a violation, um, both you know subject matter jurisdiction and then having an actual defendant. Um, very limited opportunities to do that. And then um, actual state accountability, so suing the state of Iran um, in an international court, um, um, it's politically that's just um, unlikely, we're unlikely to see that. That leaves opportunities for um, actions against non-state actors, so putting pressure or leverage on um, companies that are doing business in Iran and are complicit in human rights violations and um, come to law school, take some courses on that. Again, um, fairly, you have to have everything kind of align, um, but I think we're gonna see some interesting, it's very hard there to get evidence to actually show that it's the state that's responsible. So there's, there's many legal challenges, which I think just goes back to an earlier part of the conversation um, where it's making noise taking the lead from defenders, using those opportunities, using the spaces that are available and maximizing um, essentially the political leverage that those offer. And it's in conjunction with lots of social um, actors and political actors that we can see change affected until and unless such time as there's, um, you know, there's substantial change in, in, uh, in, on the ground in Iran. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions from the live audience? Does anyone come up? No? No? Okay. You can, yeah, there's one. There is one. Yes. Okay. Hold on one second, please. Hi, um, my name is Ria, and I'm a student at Berkeley. I was just wondering, so, in the case when you know international law often can't, well, if that even exists, um, can't even be enforced in the first place or international human rights. Um, when we look at the country itself, so when we're talking about Iran, if you're in a situation where at the end of the day, like laws are made by the government and if people's voices or democracy isn't acting as it's supposed to be, then what are the options for revolution? Like what are the options to give power back to the people if dissent is, is so widely oppressed, it, it feels like almost an impossible situation to get out of if no one's helping you from the outside and on the inside, you're systematically being shut down. Like how does a power imbalance like that ever get changed? Who's the question? Um, I didn't get to ask her um, who uh, she wants, who's, uh, uh, who's supposed to answer your question, who you're addressing it to. Oh yeah, um, anyone can answer it, but it seems like Amir is interested in talking. So if you want to answer that question. Thank you. Well, I mean, again, you know, when you look, for instance, at South Africa, um, Bishop Tutu would always say, um, you know, it's just one of his most brilliant uh, things is that nobody ever really believed that anything in South Africa would the change would be possible. Um, but if South Africa could go through the kind of change that it did, 
um, so can other countries. And as an Iranian, I've always drawn inspiration from that. Um, you know, Mandela was in prison for a very, very long time. Um, the nature of the struggle went on for a very long time. Uh, Reagan and Thatcher didn't support uh, change in, in South Africa. Um, it was the sort of Congressional Black Caucus, which was mobilized actually by, um, by Mayor, by uh, Congressman Dellums, who was from Berkeley, that, that sort of shifted uh, public opinion in America. So, so I think that, you know, I, th I think that change is actually very, very possible, especially now when information moves at the speeds that it does. I wouldn't be surprised if Putin falls. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if there is very quick change in Iran. I mean, 2009 isn't too far, too far. I mean, I think the main thing is that we can't think short term. Um, we have to have long memories and we have to find our allies and our friends and our partners. And we've got to stick it. I mean, I mean, people like Nasrin and Mandela, like 46 days on hunger strike. Consider the number of years Mandela went to prison because of, you know, if you, if you believe in something, um, then you give it and you give it everything. It's very hard for change not to come by. I mean, look at slavery uh, and its shifts in America I and mean, we're still struggling with it. So I just feel that, I just think that I'm much more optimistic about change maybe uh, than I should be, but I am. Thank you so much for that. And uh, it is my responsibility as the moderator of this event to end it on time. And we're supposed to end it at eight o'clock. So having said that, I'd like to have Dr. Jalen Niazi to uh, please tell us um, if you want us to end the event or how, how would you like to proceed? Hi, anyone, if like anyone has any question, we can take one more. And uh, Dr. Niazi will give her closing remarks uh, along with um, one person at the audience, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Igor. Um, we, will, uh, we will promote him to the, to the panel right now. If anyone, okay, if no, okay. We have one more question from the audience. If the panelists are willing to stay for, um, for a bit longer, like another 10 minutes or so, would that be okay with you guys? Of course. Uh, I think it would be helpful if that person who's asking the question to address it to a particular person. So this way uh, okay. we have more uh, direction, okay. we save time. Yes, um, please, yes, please come over. Thank you. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, I just want to first thank uh, Jeff and Marshall for this movie. This is a, every time that I see this movie, I realize the urgency of what we need to do. And I love everything that I heard today, and I'm glad I don't share you know, Amir's view. Uh, the situation in Iran is dire. Many, many prisoners have died. Today, in the situation that actually right now people in prisons are dealing with the COVID, I don't think they have time for little by little writing letters to this person or that person. My hope is that this panel represents and put forward something that the people in this country, several times I heard their name, South Africa. I really think it has to be the kind of movement that actually took place here in Brooklyn and other cities, like people in hundreds and thousands. We slept right there in front of the spark plaza. People have to actually come out. We should rely on the people of the world. It is really, you know, insult to humanity that they have the Iran and South Africa representing the woman's life. We should actually figure out how we can ourselves do that. And my question is to everybody. I really appreciate everybody. That was a beautiful, and we need to actually fill this, you know, you know, podium place, you know, hundreds and thousands of people. And that's what I think. What should we do? And that's one of the things I have done showed this national movie, House to House. And people have to do that. We have to learn 
also from the courageous and heroism of the prisoners, like Sepi de Golian, you know, like many others. There are people who are hung hunger struck 46 days right now as we speak. So we don't have time to go little by little. I'm sorry. Thanks. Thank you so much. I, I think this was more of a statement, uh, not so much of a question. However, if anyone wants to make a comment, please do so. Can I say something quickly? Uh, <clears throat> I just, again, to be realistic, we can't just come up with like thousands of people at Berkeley and uh, wage a demonstration all of a sudden uh, it's, I wish we could, but we could not, we cannot uh, practically, but we can have more uh, transnational networks. We can appeal to more lawyers like Dr. Fletcher, to more artists and filmmakers like Jeff and Marsha. Honestly, whenever I feel very frustrated and get close to getting hopeless, I think we have people like Marsha and Jeff who are so supportive and have produced this film. We have people in Iran who are taking the risk to help with production of such documents. So we can add to, we can strengthen those types of activism. Make it, for example, I remember one of the discussion I had with Nasreen uh, about maybe um, right a few days before she was said that she has to go back to jail again, uh, despite her break that the, the, the need for the treatment. I asked Nasrin, before we lose you again, uh, lose our contact, what do you suggest us to do? She said, you know, uh, don't focus on me only. Again, talking about how selfless Nasrin is. She said, make, every week, devote every week to a political prisoner and focus on her or him so that all of them have been represented, have been seen and heard or known by people internationally. If you decide to do something that simple through organizations uh, like what Tarane Rusta has uh, founded or through wonderful people like to Jale, wonderful Jales that are here, Dr. Jale Niazi and Dr. Jale Pirnazar, through people like Amir Sultani, who, who is such a passionate advocate. We can do more systematically rather than thinking of very you know, rather unfeasible actions, but small yet persistent, continuous stress on political prisoners, shame them, shame the governments, shame, name them. And just that's how the UN works. There is no, the, the UN doesn't have teeth. It just, we have to just keep on extending the transnational organizations, do more systematic work, don't get tired. Thank you, Dr. Tohidi. And uh, Dr. Niazi, I know uh, you want to introduce someone, so you want to go ahead? Yes, I've been asked to do the closing statement, even though I don't, you know, I'm not very qualified, but here we go. Wait, uh, um, before, sorry, before you do, um, may I just um, bow before Dr. Niazi and what she's done to make this event uh, possible? This has been almost a year in the works. Um, and, and she's sort of like, you would not believe the kind of number of things that she's moved, but it was done with a vision and with a heart that's really quite glorious. So I'll let Dr. Niazi speak to that herself and perhaps to her t-shirt as well. Thank you so much. Thank you for those kind words. Um, so I would like to thank all of you, of course, uh, for uh, being here after I kind of harassed you a lot. So thank you. I also would like to thank UC Law, ASUC, and the Initiative for Iranian Studies at UC Berkeley uh, for sponsoring this event. Uh, in particular, Professor Wali Ahmadi, Dr. Jalepir Nazar, Professor Tai Alper from UC Law, 
Xing Yi, Li, and Ria Master. Um, my story as an Iranian immigrant and now a pediatrician is a different one, but through Nasreen, we have merged at this point in time. The struggles of the human rights defenders in Iran had been known to me for years, but by watching the beautifully made movie Nasreen by Jeff and Marsha, this amazing story of courage, perseverance, um, and the power of one inspired me to add my voice to the struggle. Because of her Mandela-like comparison in fighting apartheid, I researched what ordinary citizens did during the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa, which I had joined in student protests as a UC Berkeley student in the 80s. It turned out Glasgow, Scotland, had passed a short resolution asking the South African government to release Nelson Mandela and other political prisoners and had contested apartheid. In a few years, more than 2,500 cities in 56 countries around the world had signed on, adding to the global struggle which eventually overturned the apartheid structure. So I reached out to friends and through connections, I met Amir and other friends of Nasri, who then introduced me to Jeff and Marsha and other amazing defenders of human rights. Then I reached out to our city council member who unfortunately at the time was busy with COVID management, but graciously referred me to the chair of peace and justice committee of the city of Berkeley, Mr. Igor Tregup, who is actually, you, you, you see him on the panel, who is an amazing advocate for all that is right, including environmental stuff. He's like amazing. He then proceeded to pass a resolution which we had written in support of Nasreen by the Alameda County Democratic Party. Then he put me in touch with council member Terry Taplin, who championed this cause and proposed a similar, res similar resolution uh, to the city of Berkeley. Our neighbors and many other friends who believe in grassroots activism took up the baton and wrote to the city council. And as you heard earlier, the Nasreen resolution was adopted on June 20th, 29, 2021 which acknowledges that many defenders of human rights have been in prison. Many uh, prisoners of conscience have been tortured and executed by the Islamic Republic of Iran and demanded the immediate release of all prisoners of conscience and an end to the apartheid laws of the country. I have asked both um, Vice Chair Igor Tregob and Council Member Terry Chaplin to join us tonight, but I think uh, Council Member couldn't make it and it's especially heartwarming for me for uh, uh, Vice Chair uh, Tregob to be here because he is, his homeland is under attack. Um, he is originally from Ukraine and I very much appreciate your time. So I will, um, I wanna thank you and I want to ask you to see if you want to say anything to this audience. Well, thank you so much. I. I did not expect um, such a introduction. Um, and it is just an honor um, and very humbling to have had an opportunity to uh, share space with all of you and to listen to this incredible panel. Uh, thank you so much for all of your incredible organizing. Um, I think the only thing uh, left to say is that uh, the struggles going on in my homeland right now, where I still have family, are the same struggles that are going on in your homeland. Uh, I stand united with all of you because it is the same struggle no matter how hard, no matter how traumatic, no matter how depressing this fight can be. Ours is the moral arc uh, that bends towards justice. I know that if we just keep up the fight, we shall prevail against all the aggressions and injustices in this world, including in both of our countries of birth. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.
Thank you, thank you. Um, so in closing, why did I do all this or try for a year to see this screening and panel discussion happen? Because I deeply believe in the power of grassroots activism in the face of larger corporate or special interests, including governmental ones. Nasrina today, by her life story is a testament to this. So in the long run, I hope that you, future lawyers, politicians, scientists, artists, writers, activists, will align your careers with your values and the well-being of your communities and of Mother Earth. But in the short run, what can you do for this particular cause? What's uh, near and dear to my heart is to write to your city, and uh, Berkeley's already passed it. So if you live in another city, please try to have them sign on to the Nasri Institute, their resolution. What else? There is Amnesty International has many efforts for, um, for Nasreen, there's petitions for Nasreen and Nagis and Mohammed, who's, who both are in prison. Um, there's also a general strike uh, that the teachers are doing. It's a national strike in Iran um, to support that. And, um, and it's, it's it, you know, as Ria was mentioning, it sometimes feels so alone when it's so heavy on people. But if they hear it outside of the country, people are supporting them. It gives them extra energy um, to do things. There is social media. You guys are much better than this. I, I tried the computer. I always ask the younger people, my daughters, what am I doing wrong? So you can be on social media, hashtag this, hashtag free Nasreen, hashtag free Nagis Mohammadi, um, hashtag free political prisoners in, in Iran, hashtag solidarity with Iranian teachers. All of it um, is, is powerful because social media is also very powerful. So we belong to the 1% of the world and we should use our privilege to voice the concerns of the many. Only then will we find a place to live together on a sustainable thriving earth. Please don't he hesitate to reach out to me at jaleefornasrin at gmail.com if you want any sources or any petitions or anything like that. And again, I wanna thank everyone and the audience for being here and um, I'm gonna give it back to the panel. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, well, I believe this is the end of the program. Um, I would like to thank every single one of you um, on my behalf uh, for being here and also for making this world a better place. So with that, uh, good night, everyone. And Dr. Niazi, if there is anything else, if there isn't anything else, then let's, uh, we could uh, end the meeting, right? Yes. yes. Thank okay. you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you.